Thank you, Amanda. An interesting reading covers quite a lot of ground, and I'm hoping that it will be a blessing to us as we think about it this morning. We're, <clears throat> we're journeying to Ephesus, <clears throat> and uh, this map uh, depicts this uh, mission journey of Paul. Uh, you may recall that, uh, if you were listening in last week, that the Apostle Paul journeyed overland through central Turkey, but whereas on his uh, second missionary trip he was diverted up to Troy, uh, across country, and wasn't allowed to come, it says the Spirit of God prevented him from going into Asia, which is this lower western region of Turkey was called Asia by uh, the Roman cartographers. Uh, and so he's, he's now going down from cities that we've probably heard of from the Bible through uh, Hierapolis, Colossae, and then down to Ephesus on the coast. So that's where he is at the moment. And the, the ongoing journey from here is going to be <coughs> back up around Macedonia to the northwest, the top left of the map, uh, down as far as Corinth, and then back overland rather than by sea. And he's before the end of the reading that Amanda has just brought to us, he's already sent some emissaries on this route. And uh, it's because uh, he's visiting the churches again that he had established, the little communities of Christians. And also he's uh, collecting money because of the impoverished situation of the, uh, Jewish believe, the Christian believers in Jerusalem. And he's going to take money back. And so by the end of chapter 19, we get quite a large group traveling back, uh, presumably to act as uh, verifiers that the money that was delivered was, was all carried, communicated back to Jerusalem and so on, and also to provide some kind of protection. It's hard to get a handle on the ancient world, and I wondered if this map, this image, this old photograph might help us. This is the Baalbek Temple. It's not, it's not one of the ones that's mentioned in the Bible, except the name Baal is mentioned in the Bible. Uh, Baal, this is the Baalbek Temple. It's a world heritage site in Lebanon. And you can see that there are these columns. And we, we see columns again and again and again. But possibly you won't be able to see the, the people in the picture because there are at least two people in this image. And you might say, well, where are they? It is, it's an old picture and perhaps we need a better resolution. But if I enlarge it a little, if I take a segment of the picture and enlarge it, you, you still probably can't see them, but I'm going to point them out to you. Sorry, I won't bring that back again. Um, there's a man uh, standing down here. And I don't know if you can just see him up there. And there's another man in this, in here. And this is him up here. So if you take the height of a man standing in there, you start to get an idea of the, the size of the columns. Columns 10 meters high. Uh, adorned the temple of Diana at Ephesus. Now, the Parthenon in Athens is probably one of the most visited uh, of the Greek temples. And uh, Christian and I were privileged to visit it uh, some few years back. Um, but in 2014, we actually did go to Ephesus and we saw the footprint of the temple of Diana and it's twice the size of the Parthenon in Athens. So. Although the temple isn't there, it was, it was destroyed and rebuilt several times from about uh, the 6th century BC. Um, although the temple isn't there, the footprint of where it stood is, and it was massive. And it was a temple that was, uh, has a number of interesting features about it. One is that it was uh, managed by women. It was women priests who ran this temple. And the, uh, the god, uh, or the goddess, worship there was Diana. Those of us who grew up on the authorized version can remember the phrase, great is Diana of the Ephesians. Uh, and you wonder, why is it Diana and why is it now Artemis? Well, Artemis is the Greek name and Diana is the Latin name for the same deity. And that's why I use this image on the cover of our leaflet today. And next week I'll tell you a little bit more about Diana. Uh, but we're reconstructing a lot about that from archaeologists and historians are trying to reconstruct it from what we're told in many other texts from the ancient world. But here is the, uh, 
the drachma, the gold coin, as it were. Uh, a day's uh, a working man, the drachma was a day's pay for a working man, and you heard a reference to that at the end of Amanda's reading. So what are we going to discover? Well, I want you to remember as we look at this passage of Acts that it's primarily descriptive. What we have here is not something that's um, uh, proscriptive. It's not saying you have to do this or you have to do that. Luke is giving us the narrative. Uh, he has a particular standpoint as a historian, of course, all historians do, but he's writing the narrative as he's seen it and it's been communicated to him. And uh, so we're going to pick up some things that might apply to us from this uh, descriptive narrative, which takes in several events. Uh, and I don't want to spend a huge amount of time on any one of them because I want to keep moving forward with, with the journeys uh, Paul's sights are set on Rome and it's uh, going to be quite a job before he gets there and it won't be quite as he intended. So I want to look uh, in chapter 19 verse 20 it says that the word of the master became sovereign at Ephesus. The, the other versions say it grew and became strong. The idea of God's word coming into this, this uh, powerful city, a great city, uh, which I hope I'll communicate to you as we go through, um, and actually starting to change things, turning things around. How do, what power does that? How does power affect our, how, what words have power in our lives? So let's, let's think about several things that I want to outline first. First of all, we see that the word of the master upgrades John's disciples because these are the first people we're introduced to. After we're being told that Apollos has already left Corinth, uh, left for Corinth, and when, the, when Paul came to Ephesus, we're told that there were disciples there uh, and they hadn't received the Holy Spirit. And so these are John's disciples. We want to think about them. And then we want to think how, uh, how the word of God is diverted from the synagogue Sounds forth in the hall of Tyrannus, or Tyrannus, it's the word that tyranny comes from. And then uh, he up upstages the magicians, uh, the word of God turns them around completely, end up getting beaten up, and it changes people's values. So here is the word of the master. I'm saying that chapter 19, verse 20 is probably the key verse, and we want to see it doing these things uh, as as Luke is describing it and then putting in his comment. So first of all, let's go to uh, this idea of upgrading John's disciples. Well, what is a disciple? A disciple is somebody who's a learner, all right? So an L-plate is the, is the appropriate sort of designation for, for a learner. And here we have uh, some disciples, but they're not actually disciples of Jesus. They're disciples of John, John the Baptist. So presumably at some stage, some of the, the Jewish people from Ephesus had gone on pilgrimage to Jerusalem and they'd encountered John the Baptist saying to be baptized and show that you want to get ready for the coming of the Messiah. Uh, you know, the, the axe is laid at the root of the tree, those remarks that we have at the beginning of our Gospels. Uh, they heard him say those sorts of things and they participated in that. They wanted what John was talking about. They wanted the age of the Messiah to come because of whatever reason they were uh, convinced that this, the rulers of this world weren't going to bring it in. And so, so they were baptized in, with John's baptism and then after their pilgrimage they'd gone back. But they hadn't heard about Jesus. That news hadn't reached them yet. There's about a dozen of them. Luke tells us. And what, we, what we're told here is that Paul took it for granted that baptized believers uh, received the Spirit. If they were believers in Jesus, they would have received the Spirit of Christ because the, the, the water and the Spirit come together as we, we confess Jesus is Lord and we, we uh, are washed and be, become. He hadn't, these believers hadn't, these believers of John hadn't understood. Uh, that there was a subsequent baptism which Jesus had initiated. And so Paul asks two questions here. Uh, did you receive the Holy Spirit? Had, and they hadn't even heard there was a Holy Spirit. So they, they, uh, the Apostle Paul is, is encountering this as a kind of a really anomalous situation. 
Uh, and so I'm mentioning this, and I've put an extract uh, from this in the leaflet. If you want to read a bit more about it, just download that. But I mention it because in some Christian circles today, there is the anticipation that becoming a Christian is a two-stage thing. First you believe in Jesus, and then you're going to get an upstage with the Holy Spirit, a subsequent experience. But the consistent witness of the New Testament is that you can't say Jesus is Lord unless you have the Holy Spirit. So that uh, from, from the beginning of the Christian faith, God gives his spirit to us that as soon as we start to follow Jesus and trust in him, our life's on a tra different trajectory and we have the spirit. So we may feel we've moved a little further and we've got pea plates. Uh, these men were th uh, then baptized into Christ and Paul uh, in, his, uh, in his hands lays his hands on them and he sort of, as it were, puts his apostolic imprimatur on their baptism. Just as uh, Peter had done earlier on, uh, Peter and John had done in Samaria, there was, the, there was Pentecost and then there was a kind of Samaritan Pentecost. There was really a kind of Gentile Pentecost as well with, with Cornelius. And now we've, we've got these disciples of John who are being fully, as it were, baptized into Christ and receiving the Spirit. And it comes with the same sort of signs that we saw at Pentecost. That they speak in tongues. They, they uh, have this communicative ability to, to rejoice in God. And uh, it, it, uh, I don't know if it means that they get a, good, a green pea plate. But in other words, they experienced, says John Stott, a mini Pentecost. Better, he says, a Pentecost caught up with them. Uh, better still, they were caught up into it. That is, into Pentecost, as its promised blessings became theirs. Um, the blessings are for you and for your children, says uh, Peter in the first sermon in the book of Acts. For you and for your children and for all who are afar off, for as many as the Lord our God shall call. And so God is working. And here these uh, uh, disciples of John the Baptist are told of the one whom John for, uh, foreshadowed and the one to whom John pointed. And they embrace him. And it shows in a remarkable uh, phenomenon which Luke records for us here. And so we, we need to ask ourselves, I think, at this point, are we disciples of Jesus? Have we heard his call? Maybe we're just fans of some of the things he said. But we need to be more than that. Uh, the word disciple, as I've said, means a learner, the L plate. Uh, maybe some of us have got P plates on. But we're, we're sort of learning of Jesus and putting into our lives as best we can by the grace of God and by the help of the Spirit, the disciplines that will help us follow him who said, take my yoke upon you and learn of me. My yoke is easy and my burden is light and you'll find rest for your souls. Is that something we want? Is it something we're pursuing purposefully? Are we disciples? That's the first uh, cameo we see here. And then we see that Paul is, uh, the word of God diverts from the synagogue. Paul goes to the synagogue because that's where they had the scriptures. That's where they had these Old Testament books that we have in our Bible. Uh, they had them as scrolls. They unrolled them. They read them regularly. They thought about them. They remembered the past. And they prayed for the day when the day of the Lord would come and bring justice to human society. And they prayed for the one who would do it, who would embody it. Uh, they, they read of their Messiah. And Paul went there and he opened the scrolls with them. And he discussed it and talked to them about Jesus. Because when he read uh, through the scriptures, it was Christ of whom they spoke that he saw the Messiah was Jesus. And, and this was... This was hard. I've told you before that Scotland's favourite painting is this one. Uh, uh, Salvador Dali's Christ of St John of the Cross. Here it is being taken down and being sent to an exhibition in, in England. Um, this amazing painting uh, uh, depicts the crucifixion of Christ. It's a strange angle. It's, you don't often see it from above. 
Uh, and there are features of this painting that make it really interesting to me. But the, the significant thing in Ephesus would be that they were talking about somebody who was executed on a cross. And this is so awful, so bloody and awful, that it wasn't talked about in polite society. In fact, the cross didn't become a Christian symbol for several centuries. It was so repugnant. The early images of Jesus show him as a shepherd with a lamb over his shoulders. They show him in other ways, uh, but they don't show... Those who, are, those who mocked Christianity showed it. There's a piece of graffiti in the catacombs which shows uh, a crucified person with a donkey's head, and it shows uh, Alexandramanos work, worshipping his god, says the graffiti, uh, laughing at people who would... Who would, who would want a crucified God? And yet Paul is going to go on and to tell them that this is what the scriptures said. He was taken from prison and from judgment and who has declared his generation? He was cut off out of the land of the living for the transgression of my people was he stricken. And so the uh, message, while it went down well at the synagogue in Berea, uh, after some time, three months we're told, Eventually, Paul had to get out of the synagogue, uh, and some of the leading Jewish people came with him. And wh what was he to do then? Was he to move on as he had done in other places? Well, no, because the message had had sufficient grounding that people were interested. And so he went to the lecture hall of Tyrannus, or Tyrannus. Um, as I've already said, the word means uh, tyrant, and presumably the owner of the hall had this nickname of being a tyrant. I don't know whether he was a bit of a schoolmaster who used it uh, for a very rigorous educational program at other times. But we know that uh, it was made available. Presumably Paul rented it. Uh, one, one, uh, it's called the Western text. One uh, Greek text of, of the New Testament actually says that he rented it from uh, 11 in the morning to 4 in the afternoon. So uh, there was time when it was available to him and presumably other times he did his tent making and leather working. But here, here, the lecture hall of Tyrannus was where Paul continued his ministry and he stayed for two years. This is the longest he stayed in any place that we have record of. So here he is teaching away from the lecture hall of Tyrannus. And, and so we're getting really a, a prolonged uh, study of the uh, an explanation about the significance of Jesus. And let me just take you to Ephesus for a moment. Um, this is the theatre in Ephesus, the amphitheatre. Uh, Christy and I were privileged to visit it in 2014. It seats 25,000 people. That's a lot of people. Uh, this is the library in, uh, in Ephesus. You can find these images on the internet. Um, I was interested when we were there uh, looking at the library steps to discover uh, a Jewish menorah carved into the marble of the steps. And I wondered uh, how many centuries it had been there. Was it there from early on or not? Uh, this is the day we went there. It was actually quite busy. Uh, you can see there's a crowd going down the main street here. What struck me was that, that not only is there the antiquity of the place, and the marble streets, uh, the phenomenal wealth that there would have been to have such uh, passageways. And uh, you can possibly also see a marble road heading off in the picture of the amphitheater on the left. It's a huge marble roadway that runs toward the coast. Uh, and uh, it, it, uh, later on, Paul comes to the coast, uh, to Miletus, and he talks to the elders from the church that, have, from the church that has developed here. But one of the most interesting things was that on the hillside on the, uh, on the left here of this image and further down, there is a huge covered area. Uh, next week I just may show it to you in a Google <laughs> photograph. Um, what is this huge covered area today? Well, the answer is it's, an, it's a working archaeological site. Uh, it's funded by um, German industry. And uh, it's uncovering in, in the hillside a whole bank of terraced houses. I'll show you one photo of them. This is a photo 
from under the covered area. It's covered to protect the excavation. And what they've discovered is, um, is it seven terraced houses which have amazing uh, inlaid uh, mosaic floors, not just designs, but sometimes animals and uh, other creatures on them and on the walls. Looking from above down into it, from the walkways that you walk around through this area, uh, they look like carpets, but they're not. Um, and these houses, this is the, the Turak. If you know Melbourne, you know Turak. This is the Turak of Ephesus. This is where the wealthy lived. This is where they had hot and cold running water. This is where sewage was well disposed of. This was an upmarket part of town. This was tribute to the wealth that there was in Ephesus. We don't know where Tyrannus's lecture hall was. Nobody actually knows. It's not labelled. It hasn't survived as far as we know. There are ruins all over the place. Uh, you'll find the Nike symbol there, the Nike swoosh. It's one of the first things the tourist guides show you. So there's, here in this amazing uh, ruin, we, we get a sense of the magnificent, magnificence of a city of 2,000 years ago and more. And uh, it was driven by... Uh, a kind of superstition relating to a meteorite falling from heaven and this being the god visiting its people. And then as the centuries passed, it became the worship of the goddess Artemis or Diana. Now, in this culture, magic flourished. And uh, we heard Amanda read about the magicians, the sons of Sceva, who, who uh, presumably were trying to... Uh, motivated perhaps by desire to heal people or bring health, but presumably also to, to make money out of this process. And, uh, and they, they see that the work that's happening as a result of Paul's ministry is having a healing effect in people's lives. In fact, it's unexplainable healing effect. It, it's, it's like upmarket magic, that, that handkerchiefs and things that have been the Apostle Paul, they're being taken and laid on people so that they, they might touch them as if the mere contact with these things would have the same effect as the woman who touched the hem of Jesus' garment. Uh, there was this belief about physical proximity and contact. And so these magicians, uh, they decide that they're going to start using the name of Jesus. And they try to, to do their healing in his name. And they get a shock. What happens is uh, they, they uh, prevalent in Ephesus, they come along and they, they use the name of Jesus, but there's a response from this man they're trying to heal. And the response is, presumably in some voice that nobody quite recognized, Jesus I know, Paul I know, but who are you? Who are you? This is the question. Uh, and so, so here is the sense that there is another, there is a real depth to the world. There's more to the world than meets the eye. And there is, a, at that interface, there is a lot of uh, mystery, stuff that's hard to explain. And it's a dangerous interface. So we can understand why people want to explore it. But... But what we're sort of learning here is that uh, Jesus has power that reaches into that area. And Jesus' power is known there. But we need to be cautious about it. So what was the way of Jesus? How does it change people's lives? Let's just think about this for a minute. As we come to the end of the reading, we hear that, that uh, people are, are turned uh, more and more to believe in what Paul is saying. And uh, presumably a whole group of uh, younger people take their magic books and they decide it's not the future for them. And they burn these uh, ornate and elaborate books which have great value. Astonishing value. And, and, and so uh, as they, they put them up in, in, in the fire, they, we realize that it's not just values that have changed, but the people themselves are being turned around. What's turning them around? Well, let's just think for a minute. They're learning new things. Uh, they're learning the way of the master, Paul tells us. The word of God has come to them. It's come in a very powerful way. Uh, in, in, uh, earlier in Acts, in chapter 6, 
Uh, Luke tells us that the word of God grew and was, was flourishing. In chapter 12, we get another sort of footnote, or not footnote, but a note in the text that says, yes, it's continuing to happen. And what's happened now is we're in Acts 19.20, and we're told the word of the master was now sovereign and prevailed in Ephesus. That's the message translation of this particular verse. The word of the Lord prevailed in Ephesus. People are being changed by the message. It's getting inside them and turning them around. So we need to ask ourselves, how is the word of God impacting us? As the word of the master sounded from the the lecture hall of Tyrannus, um, what we can see what it was doing, but what's it doing today? Well, let's, from our standpoint in time, we can look back and we can see that it has had a huge impact. Um, impact is the word. Um, Tom Wright says it was having economic, cultural, and religious impact. And as soon as people start adding up the cost of the books that are being burned, people are thinking, well, this could be a problem, right? As soon as money comes into the picture, we know that it's the hip pocket nerve that really uh, people respond to. And so, what impact has it had, say, in our culture, in my culture and yours? I want to suggest a number of things that we are beneficiaries of. The whole world doesn't value education the way uh, that we do in Australia, the way the West has, has done for centuries. Um, I remember reading an educational specialist, uh, Scott, who should have known better in my opinion, that he said that the Industrial Revolution was what sparked universal education uh, in the UK. But I would have said that if you went back to 1650 and the, when the Presbyterian Church, the Church of Scotland was established, it was following John Knox's plan for a, a, a minister, a schoolmaster, and care of widows and orphans in every parish. That was, that was a three-pronged attack that John Knox had for Scotland. And when the Church of Scotland became established in 1650, uh, those were the plans that, that every parish would have a schoolmaster because people needed to learn to read and write. Uh, a couple of years ago, I went to the uh, lecture, the, I think it's the Philip Johnson lecture, in me memory of the first chaplain uh, on the first fleet uh, and it was given by a, a woman uh, Sarah um, Stonebreaker is part of the name she's a lecturer at Sydney University and she made it clear that the whole concept of human rights uh, which many people say goes back to the Enlightenment she made it clear that it goes way back beyond the Enlightenment. It goes way back into the New Testament and then through that into the Old Testament. It goes back to Genesis, to the idea that the man and the woman have dignity. They're in the image of God and that people should be treated with respect. We, we expect human rights and when they're abused, when people are exploited, we feel uh, indignant and outraged. And so we should. And the separation of powers between government and the military. There's been a coup in Sudan. The military has taken over. The military have taken over in Myanmar. And we are concerned about this because there should be ways in which the role of the military is circumscribed. And, and so we, we, we look for balances and checks in our, in our governmental system. We're used to health education. We're concerned about public education. Health. We've been concerned about it all through COVID. It wasn't until in Britain, in the Victorian era, they moved, they built sewers to take the sewerage out of town that they managed to eradicate uh, cholera from, from uh, London. And yet there are cities in the world where cholera still abounds. Why is that? because the public health concern hasn't been there. The money the government has had has not been spent on public health or education. It's often been spent on weapons. So our culture is the beneficiary of many things that have come to us through the ministry of the Word of God in our community. Maybe not everybody believes it, 
But where enough people believe it, they will change their culture. Perhaps the greatest example of this is when William Wilberforce persuaded the British Parliament. He, was, uh, he tried for many, many years. But when eventually the bill to abolish slavery happened, the British government spent half of the national budget, half of the budget, to, to uh, secure this, to patrol the sea lanes, to stop uh, British people from running slave ships, uh, to recompense people in the, uh, in the West Indies and so on. So there was a massive amount of money put to it, just as we have seen money being put to the burning of magic in Ephesus. And then, of course, it's not just the past, not just getting, but getting rid of those destructive things in my own life. We've inherited certain things, but how is it affecting me socially and personally? And how am I changing? How has my mind been changed by the gospel of Jesus Christ? The question is, am I a disciple? I came across this week uh, this comment from Tom Wright. Um, and it was uh, posted by John Dixon from the Center for Public Christianity. It's odd, says Tom Wright, who's arguably the best known historian in the Western world at the moment. It's odd, says Tom Wright, how, many, how reticent many Christians, clergy included, are to discuss theology, since Christian theology is what underpins almost everything that secular humanism in the West tend to take for granted, including, of course, secularism and humanism themselves. So he's saying that the way in which people are secular and, and atheist in the West is a product uh, even or a reaction against things that Christianity has brought. And they don't make sense in many parts of the world. We need to think about this. Why could a, a, a historian, Tom Wright, who doesn't claim to be a Christian, but who... Tom Holland, I beg your pardon. Thank you, Christine. Tom Holland, who doesn't get my Toms mixed up sometimes. Tom Holland, who doesn't pr pr uh, put himself out there as a Christian, although he's sympathetic, and it's worth reading the introduction of his book to, to see where he stands. Uh, uh, he, he's, he's saying this. And I think what we're seeing here is that what happened in Ephesus, the word of the master, now sovereign and prevailed. And the question for you and me is, is it prevailing in our lives? How is it changing us? How is it changing our community? May God help us all to be disciples of the way of Jesus. Amen. Now Amanda's going to play a piece for us. I'm looking forward to hearing uh, what you share, Amanda, as we reflect on these things.
Thank you, Amanda. Now I invite you to join with me as we pray to God. We come with our prayers of intercession this morning. Let us pray. Almighty God, our times are in your hands. As Paul said to the Athenians, it is in you we live and move and have our being. As we bow before you now, receive us anew as your children, in the name and for the sake of your beloved Son, our Master and our Saviour, Jesus. We thank you that as our Lord and Master, we have one who could say with all honesty, take my yoke and learn of me, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light, and you shall find rest for your souls. We are so grateful that the message of Jesus traveled those Roman roads and was shared by your disciples to both Jew and Gentile, male and female, and slaves as well as free citizens. Thank you that Jesus so loved the world that he gave his life to redeem it from the futility of idolatry and to bring the many blessings of worship and service of the living God into our society and culture. Teach us anew the way of the Lord, that in our divisive and intolerant times we might daily put into practice how to love our neighbour as ourselves. Disciple us in the ways of Jesus. In our life as a church, help us to assist one another to draw near to you and to each other with faith and love, maintaining a unity of spirit. Keep us open to your word and to the personal challenges we face as we clothe ourselves in the countercultural wardrobe that you have provided. Lord Jesus, please help us to journey with you and to keep step with your spirit as we travel through the days and the seasons of our lives. Guide us in the coming weeks to maintain necessary COVID safeguards and regulations as Victorian society reopens from lockdown. As road and air travel surges, we pray for safety, especially over this holiday weekend. As churches, businesses and clubs and societies tentatively yet excitedly reopen, enable us to reach the 90% fully vaccinated level that will help those who cannot be vaccinated to feel safer. We pray especially for hospital staff and other frontline workers facing exceptional demands at this time. We remember the poor nations where vaccination levels are so very low. Please forgive us that our human structures are so clumsy that the wealthy waste many thousands of vaccines while the poor nations are undersupplied. Today we pray for the well-being of the Queen, unable to attend the United Nations COP26 conference. May that conference take real steps to reduce global pollution and protect the environment so that poverty will be alleviated. May we each play our part in reducing waste and pollution. I pray again for Afghanistan and the terrible uncertainties faced by citizens there, especially those targeted by the Taliban and denied education or full participation in their society. We commit to you any elderly, frail, sick and troubled friends this morning as we commit them to you in the silence of our hearts. Pray that you will help the little communications that we share with them to be reminded that they are not forgotten by us or by you. And we ask this in the name of Jesus, who invites us to pray together, saying, Our Father in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, 
thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive them that trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Thank you for being with us. God bless you. May the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship and communion of the Holy Spirit be with you, now and always. Amen.